Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this week on Tales of Tyria, we have, well, a lot of news from the last two weeks. We've got some great story time, some mailbag, and a bit of table scraps this week. Let's cover some small topics. Stay tuned. It's coming up. Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria right here in the Sound Strategy Network. I am your host, Bridger. I will be bringing you all the news and discussion and topics of all kinds from the Guild Wars 2 universe. We're glad you got a hold of the program, however you may have found it. Tell a friend or two, won't you? We are almost live, as you can see, from the Cloud Skimmer Tavern right here in the Great Free... As always is my good friend, Freelancer, from Team Legacy. Welcome, sir. Hey, how's it going? Not I wish bad. it was always. Not quite lately, almost, right? Almost, almost. I think we <laughs> almost, missed you last yeah. time. But uh, that was for very good reason, I think. And we actually delayed tonight's yes. show just so we could get you back. Yeah, last night, uh, if you guys didn't know, my, my wife is... She's got to be like eight, seven, eight months pregnant now. So had a little bit of, a, of an emergency last night, but we're good. So... Uh, yeah, so thank you guys for uh, showing up one day late. It's kind of my fault, even though Bridger won't say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, no, actually, Grublock brings up a very interesting point. We're not doing Planet Side 2 tonight. We're doing Guild no. Wars 2. It's an every other week thing. Uh, so we're doing Tales of Tyria this week, next week, next Sunday is going to be Tales of Araxis, the official launch of the show. Last week was sort of a prototyping and sort of a, you know, let's get sort of co comfortable with the situation. I had two brand new hosts, which did wonderfully, and you can see that up on YouTube right now. So next week we're going to do an official launch with a lot more specific discussion rather than introductions of ourselves. So that's, that's the way it's currently set up, and sound-strategy.net will be the new website. It's still under construction. Uh, I'm kind of redoing it right now and trying to figure out how how that all works so uh i know i know we're uh, we're having a lot of fun playing planet side we're playing league we're playing guild wars 2 lots of great stuff happening these days lots of good games out there and far cry 3 yeah are you yeah, playing have that? you looked into the, i'm trying to convince my wife to let me get um uh I've, well you know i've recently bought uh, i must have bought like 20 dollars of gems and stuff and then obviously we have a lot of things with uh, the new little one coming mm -hmm. on the way, so the mini freelancer, if you will. Uh, so trying to convince her to spend sixty bucks, because you know if you buy a game, you got to get the digital deluxe game. You know, <laughs> you can't just get the you can't get the regular one. Well, is there even so, a regular edition for fifty bucks? Are games even costing fifty bucks anymore? Yeah, there's a regular one for oh, okay. fifty bucks. So yeah, you can uh, you can get the regular for fifty. But the coolest thing about the Far Cry game, if you guys haven't looked into it, is uh -oh. it's like. Uh oh. What? <laughs> Cat. Oh, my cat! <laughs> he's tipping over your plant, like. It Look, was, he's co it, he's coming in for the kill. <laughs> it was at fifth. It was at forty degrees, almost about to fall over. And when I said, "Look out!" you started to turn around. He put it back. He's like, "No, no don't." Me. He's he he's he's innocent, Bridger. I didn't see it, so it must have not have happened. <laughs> I got it on camera. He can't get out of this one. All right. So, yes. <laughs> so yeah, but like Fall, uh, Far Cry 3 is essentially like an open world version of like the previous Far Cries yeah. and Fallout and stuff. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. I want to get it. I really the do. The trailer so. looks really fascinating. And I have to say, I really enjoyed Far Cry 1. And the Far Cry 2 I heard was a letdown for a lot of people. That was their first foray into the open world gameplay. But it people was. said it was yeah. very repetitive. In a lot it, of it was, it was like it was one of those games. You know those games you play that are great, but then they need to like be cut in half to really be great. You know to be awesome. Yeah. That was one of those games. Like the first six hours of of doing the game was was awesome, and you're into it, and the cinematics were great. But then they like extended it out a bit too far. You know, it's it's kind of like it reminds me of games like. Um, uh, 
just throw one off the top of my head here. I'm just, you know, those kind of like this. I can't really think of anyone in particular. I'm thinking like Darwinia and stuff, but um, you know those indie games that like are not, they don't try to extend them out. You pay 10 bucks for oh, them. Yeah, they last yeah. you no six filler. hours. No but, filler. Yeah, exactly. And then you just, you, you the, love them. Like Bastion. Bastion was a great oh, yeah, game Bastion, like that. You know, Bastion was Portal, like a... Portal 1. Portal, Perfect right. example. Three hours every single minute was amazing. They didn't put any filler in there. Yeah. And so those kind of games are uh, kind of what Far Cry 2 needed to be. Like, mm -hmm. it tried to extend itself out too much. But anyway, so on to Guild Wars 2. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, I'm really excited. Going to check that out. But guess Guild Wars 2, it is. So uh, my story time for this week was we had actually, I believe this was Thursday last week. We we had was it Thursday or or, or Friday? We tried to do a crazy ninja night. Uh, I think it was last Thursday or last Tuesday. It was a good time. We had basically decided that zerging is for fools. <laughs> And let's find out what happens if we do the complete opposite of Zerging. I believe the question we were trying to answer was, how many orange swords can we get to show up on the map at exactly the same time? <laughs> yeah, so the concept was, and this was like literally last minute, it was like, let's take our groups and our guild and rename them to crazy probably not realistic clan names so we had like the Wu clan the shishi clan we <laughs> anything you can imagine and see how many uh orange swords or how many smaller groups we could run and how effective it would be so we uh we had 12 uh five oh i should point out this is in world versus world i'm not sure i said that but for the right, people out yeah. there very confused so we had never like, been there 12 to 12 to 15 at one point five man groups uh five to six to seven man groups uh just and the whole point was it was supposed to be a contest right so you you were not allowed to work with the other clans you if you saw another clan you had to go the other way you know and you couldn't work with them you couldn't get together and form like even a 10 man zerg right so they all split off went their own different directions and it, it was a lot of fun um which which clan did you end up in bridger i was leading the imperial roman ninjas <laughs> <laughs> you were the one that didn't, uh, yeah. I turned our clan. I changed our clan's name because I'm not an Eastern Eastern uh, Hemisphere fan, Eastern history fan. I really like the Western history, the Romans and the Greeks. That's my that's my right. foray. So I, I <laughs> just like I went back to the Roman ninjas. Well, all joking aside, <laughs> what we ended up finding out was that a killing Doliax and killing uh, taking supply camps and escorting Doliax, which obviously once we had like twelve different small groups out, like all they could do was escort. Dolly X and kill Dolly X, that we were getting, uh, I don't know, we, we'd have to record it and look at look at the streams, but it seemed like we were getting a lot more points than if we were running around as like one large or two two or three main large groups like we normally do. Um, it I don't know. I, I mean, I really want to look further into that because I haven't seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, somebody in, um, in chat, but... I haven't seen any official words, but it seems like killing Doliax and escorting Doliax also gets you points, like considerable amount of points, uh, than um, just I, running around taking points. I've been told killing Doliax, I think that our science team figured out killing Doliax definitely gives you right. like one point for each Doliax you kill. But do we know that for certain? Is it definitely one point or is <laughs> that... Yeah, so that's that's something I'd like to look into a little yeah, bit more. I know flipping if, those if, flipping on those flags does, uh, so that certainly helps. But <laughs> what do you? How do you think it would affect the player base though if you knew as a guild that killing a Doliac gave you three points? Like, what if it actually said it? Like, you know, a supply camp always gives you five points per tick. Yeah. You know, a tower. You know, et cetera, et cetera. What if you knew definitively, like Arena that came out and said it, that taking a uh, checkpoint, you know, with a little guard there, or taking a, or killing a Doliac gives you this amount of points. Would it not click in guilds' minds or Zerg's minds that if I get three points for killing a Doliac, that sending out two or three groups to kill three Doliacs per tick, that's essentially, you know, nine points. That's, that's worth tower. more than taking my entire Zerg and hitting this camp or hitting this camp and stuff. I... No, I don't know. I'm just throwing out ideas. Maybe you know things like that could split up the Zerg, so to speak. Yeah, I just, I just wonder what the opposing leaders, like the commanders and the other factions or servers, must have thought when they see orange serves everywhere. Like they're getting scouting reports. Like we've got, we've got Team Legacy at at the south the southern supply camp, and somebody else is like, no, 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 they're they're at the northern, the far north of the map. No, no, they're assaulting Dreadfall Bay. What? Which one of you is lying to me? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I can only hope maybe one day they remove Orange Swords. I said that a few episodes back. I uh, I think removing Orange Swords, uh, the maps are not as big as everybody thinks they are. You can That's get from true. one side, you can get from one side to another very quickly, especially if you're a thief or ranger, etc. Um, and it forces groups, it forces organized servers, especially in the top tiers, to assign scouts and assign you know defensive garrisons and stuff. Because if you don't have the intelligence, that source of intelligence that the game doesn't give you, you know via these orange swords, then you essentially um, you you got to you know you play more strategically. You got to assign those people, and I think that's more engaging than just pressing M like us, all of us commanders do. We're all guilty of it. We religiously press M every thirty seconds just to see if an orange sword popped up. And yeah, yeah, I'm I don't know. I think uh, I haven't seen any better ideas. I think just removing the orange sword would be a big step in the right direction. But um, what do you think of these new changes coming up? Have you oh, have you seen oh, the new patch hey, notes? Mr. Oh. Segway, Mr. Segway. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the world versus world updates you're referring to in the Winter's Day patch. Uh, right. Habib Lowe, the gameplay programmer at uh, ArenaNet, put out a patch a patch notes uh, sort of preview that says that this is coming on the Winter's Day patch, which I believe is hitting the 14th of December, and specifically, they're going to provide some advanced notification of, for people that are, you know, because I guess they got a lot of people complaining like, oh, I just put down 300 golems! Ah, oh, now you make the whole server reset! Oh, there's all my money gone! <laughs> uh, so, they're, they, they're promising to put more advanced notification, but you notice they don't promise a specific number. <laughs> Nothing in there is, it's, it's all very vague that says, we will attempt to provide you with some notification, and and that will take place in some window of time before we update. <laughs> it's not like, yeah, we'll do it five minutes before, 30 minutes before, 25 minutes before. They're like, at some point before we patch. Right now it's three minutes. We're going to ascend. We're going to attempt to do better than that. <laughs> Did the chat warn you about your cat? I got it. Yep. <laughs> He's probably. But, um, uh, you know, these uh, on topic, though. <laughs> These new changes, what I mean, going into, uh, I don't know if you put anything or, or we're going to really go into the calling, but uh, did you get a chance to experience the new calling? They kind of slipped that in, you know, and didn't really make any official announcements about it. Did you actually get to see, like, how it, uh, how it appears in combat? Uh, I noticed, I, I didn't see it myself, but I noticed that they said specifically they tried to make it such that the... Uh, the allies that you see become less than they were before so that you can see more enemies. Right. Yeah, um, so were you... I don't think you were there Friday or Sunday night. You weren't there last night when we were raiding, right? No, I was um, not. So, we, you know, we really got to get a feel for it for the first time, basically going out, and um, we, we just told everybody, look, we got 60, 70 TL. Let's go out and we want to get a general consensus on what we think about this new calling. Now, they've said that this is a temporary idea, which is you see less friendlies, uh, specifically the ones near you, and, or uh, the ones further away from you, actually, and then you see more enemies. So we went out there, and I got to say, it's night and day. Really? There was never, yeah, now, you know, when we pull everybody together just to run a crazy Zerg, just to test things, it's you know there's there's calling everywhere you can never see enemies okay so we decide instead of splitting off into separate groups and stuff we pull everybody together and just see how bad it is or how good it is mm -hmm. and i can't say statistically we saw x amount of players versus friendlies but there was never a, a scenario at all um, with 40, 30, or 40 uh, friendlies running with us that we did not see the exact positions of the enemy groups ah. um, it was Incredible. So last night we went to, like, uh, I think we're facing Blackgate and stuff. We went to one of the Borderlands, and this enemy guild was running around doing a great job. So basically, we were countering them, they were countering us, and we were going back and forth. Normally, you know how it is, Bridger, you got to kind of look for the spell effects. You know, you look for the where, where's those elementalists dropping those fields at? You know, where do you see this? Because then you can tell generally where the enemies are. Or you have to look for the projectiles, or right? Or just where the... spam the walls because they're probably <laughs> up there. Yeah. So, but in this case, um, uh, when anybody goes out now, and, and this is kind of encouraging everybody go out and look now, um, you can actually see where all the enemies are maneuvering around. So, 
we saw them flanking us going up the left side of the mountain and we were able to instantly react and we threw all of our AoEs down and buffs and finishing combos and stuff. We saw them immediately jump into a portal, which this is where things get sketchy normally. We saw them jump into a portal, uh, one of the guild leads pop a portal, then we saw the Mesmer coming at us, roll behind us, blink behind me, and drop his exit portal. And now in any other scenario in any weeks past, you would have never seen that Mesmer run up. You would have never seen that group all stack up on their portal like that. So they dropped this exit portal right behind us. We saw it coming. They all poured in. Um, obviously, all of our guys, mass AOE, we saw 20 red dead people all <laughs> over the place. It was great. And see, you could never have done this earlier. So if this is a, a temporary fix, I'm excited. Like, this may be just what we need to kind of revitalize World v. World a bit because I think while World v. World is dying or maybe stagnant right now, it's one of the major reasons is due to calling. So if this is a temporary fix to what they claim to be a better one coming out uh, later on, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. And the other things that we have looking forward to uh, during the Winter's Day patch uh, Alt F4 is no escape. <laughs> I did not realize that this was a problem, but I guess if you if you pull it, the plug on your internet connection, you won't die. <laughs> yeah, and now, you won't give see, XP. see, you can't log out, I believe, while you're in combat, right? Mm -hmm. So you essentially, uh, the idea was that players could run up, they try to get out of combat, and then log out. They can still apparently do this. But if you are got your speed buffs on and stuff, you can keep them in combat by throwing ranged attacks at them. But what they used to still do, and it, it was very prevalent, especially if you ran off kind of solo taking camps and stuff, you'd see it all the time, um, was players that would want to knock out their dailies. Okay, And I, I didn't know this until I actually asked somebody. This was back when you could whisper enemies. Okay, So I came across this guy attacking a supply camp. Um, I, I'm sorry, the little checkpoint guy um, outside of the supply camp. Mm -hmm. And he, as he's taking it, he just killed the guard there, the veteran guard. I run up to kill him. I'm running my glass cannon. You know, you're dead in five seconds build. And he poofs, disappears. So I'm like, okay, well, if he logs back in, he's not going to appear right there. So I'm just going to kind of peruse around the area. Turns out the same guy, and he, he was a big old char with his spiky armor, so you couldn't miss him comes back and I right clicked him and whispered him and saying uh, you know that's kind of uh, I think I said something like that's kind of cheap or something and he said look I don't even like World v. World I just come out here because this is the best place to do my dailies and you know I'm, I'm still kind of got like a sour taste in my mouth but they uh, t apparently before even if you were in combat like because I had tagged him a few times you could auto for and log out and this I guess is a really big problem on some servers so um, I'm glad they fixed that. But they... I'm curious why he says it's the best place to do his dailies. Like, is he mean? Oh, it is by far of the the variety <laughs> one specifically. The the guy knows the stuff. Yeah, the the easiest way to do your dailies if you're somebody like me, which uh, you log in midday right before you go to work or something or you know whatever, and you try to knock out all your dailies real fast. The best place to do it is a borderland because uh, just sweeping along the southern edge of the borderland, you can knock out your 15 variety types because there are 17 types on the southern edge of the Mm -hmm. uh, you can knock out uh, obviously all your crafting. There's always a rich node in the southern, um, southwestern side of the middle supply camp in the south, which mm -hmm. will obviously that's nine or what is that nine? I think nine, nine or 20. ten. Yeah, yeah. So that's half of your crafting. So yeah, and most players, most uh, of uh, those that are kind of like achievement whores and stuff, which I'm guilty, you know. Uh, already know about this. They will basically take off in the south of the supply camp, cut around the south, and you will knock out all your dailies in about ten minutes. Yeah, you got uh, the spiders, you got the you got mm -hmm. the underwater reptile dudes, you got moas, you got doliacs. and your events. Your yeah, your events are your doliacs and taking out your checkpoints. So uh, it's really easy, and that's where you're seeing a lot of players do that. But um, then of course now they added these new structured PVP dailies. What do you think about those? Do you even do the dailies? Probably not, right? <laughs> Um, I do when I'm on, but I don't get on every day. I, it's it just, you know, I've got, I, I, I don't have the, the MMO gene in me that needs to have all the things as much. Uh, I, I, it's just not the, not the way that I enjoy Guild Wars 2, but I appreciate that other people do enjoy it that way. But I like being able to get a bunch of XP for stuff that I'm just doing anyway. I'm always going to be getting, you know... 
the, the mining and and I'm always going to be killing lots of different things. Now that's the most annoying one to me because usually it means when I'm at like 12 and I've been doing whatever, either uh, I've just been in a dungeon or I'm in World v. World or I'm in something else, it means I have to look off the beaten track and find, ooh, did I kill a, kill a boar type yet? I don't know, maybe. Let's go kill this one and find out. It's just, err, <laughs> so annoying. And if you're an ore, forget about it. No, you're not doing nothing. So, <laughs> but yeah, I can definitely see <laughs> how that, that yeah. but I mean, that's the other thing, is that system encourages me when we're in the middle of a zerg and we're trying to go from place to place as fast as possible, you, you want to know why the entire zerg goes out and tags the that doliac as we're running by it's or have you ever seen what an enemy zerg or like even some of our guys like all of them chop down the same tree it's like yeah. <laughs> it's like poor tree yeah um but you know just since we're on the topic and ending it real quick those that are curious uh best way to do uh your structured dailies if maybe you're not a big structured guy and you have trouble getting that top stats one which i get asked all the time people whispering me how do i get my top stats one what's the easiest way surefire way of doing it all you have to do is res somebody. <laughs> and how pathetic is that where you will get the top stat for resing somebody if you res one person? Um, it's uh, it's kind of funny every time it happens. But huh. when you go – so there's four dailies, Spridger, okay? Yeah. There is killing X amount of players. There's capturing points. And then there's participating in three matches. Mm -hmm. And then there's you have to get the top stat, like the top – rank of a particular thing in the structured pvp match Superb. so you can get like top captures you can get top kills top whatever and a lot of times with the more casual players they can't get you know a top stat they're just not that good or they're not putting enough focus in it usually the latter and they ask or they type out in guild chat or stuff how do i get that top stat what's the easiest way to do it and ironically the best way of doing it is following a enemy group and just resing somebody because res uh, resurrecting or helping revive somebody is considered a stat in the match and nobody does it nobody does it because <laughs> you're going to come back in 10 seconds anyway and it takes well, a long time to revive well, from you know I, I could argue that you'd see your team win a lot more if you were resing yeah, maybe, your players maybe. but i don't uh, play enough structured tvp to be able to comment on it i'm just i'm just hypothesizing it's uh, everybody should be running quickness and resing as soon as you see somebody go down. But yeah, that's another, another oh, story. Oh yeah, but. if only my elementalist had quickness. <laughs> Mr. Mesmer is still the best at everything. I know in a lot of competitive builds, thieves uh, since the beginning of structure PvP, they activate quickness and res, and that's what usually what they save it for, or to finish off somebody. Um, Mesmer's myself, like I, if I see multiple players go down, I'll throw down a time warp just to get them up quickly. Uh, not only do you get ten points from it, but uh, you also you never know what kind of friends you'll make. So uh, it's it's a little different because everybody runs all these different matches of structured PvP. They never expect somebody to actually resurrect them. You know? And then when it happens, they're like, oh, that was different. Who are you? You know. <laughs> so it's a good way to meet new friends and stuff, especially when you're doing PvE and Worldly World as well. Yep, and we've got, let's see, a couple other things here. No more insta-build wall and gates. So destroyed walls and gates, this took me a little bit to wrap my head around. Basically, you notice when the walls get destroyed and somebody goes over to start repairing the wall, they put two supply into the thing, bam, wall is completely fixed, nobody can get through it. I'm not entirely sure how they go from destroyed to finished <laughs> in that time, but now it won't happen anymore. You have to put at least 10% health on the wall before the visual of the wall being completed is in effect and it won't actually block people from getting in or out until that point as well. So no more of those Zerg flies in through the open wall and then one person comes in and traps them inside. <laughs> we actually had the opposite happen to us just last night. Um, we were we just took the garrison off of Blackgate, I think it was, and we had this enemy group that had a treb from uh, Sunny Hill. Hitting us from Sunny Hill, you know, that little tower off to the left, they can build trebs there and hit the wall. So finally they knocked down the outer garrison wall, and we're... We're nearing the end of our night, so we're like, you know what? We're going to do this epic charge out at the enemy as soon as the wall goes down. We do that, and some friendly pugs repair the wall as half of our group gets out. And so we got maybe 20 guys out coming against this other 50-man Zerg. <laughs> and oh, no. we turn around, and like all of our other guys are stuck behind the wall because they got repaired halfway before they ran out. So I was it, helping! I was helping! And, you know, remember Battle of Dreaming Bay, um, when we went to attack that, it happened numerous times where we had, you always have to keep somebody on the treb because yep. somebody always taps it with one supply and pops up the wall and ruins your whatever plan you had. So you have to keep somebody on the weapons. Now you can effectively knock down the wall, 
you're kind of given a window of opportunity now where you can kind of rush in, you know, go for the kill. All right. So lastly, and this is probably the big one that may change things for some people. There's a new type of event to coming to World vs. World called the Breakout Event, which is essentially a big group of, uh, well, I don't know if it's a big group. We really don't know. It's basically described as an NPC general who will rally all the people in the starting spawn area if they get all their towers, keeps, and castles taken off the map. If they have nothing but supply camps or nothing at all, uh, then a, an NPC will come into the starting zone, start an event that says, gather round, we will, we will take it all back. And when a certain number of players gather around him, then he, he summons his, his special trusty Doliac to give everybody full supply and moves out with the group who now go to probably a tower just outside, I would guess, and retake that, and he builds siege for them, uh, helps them anyway, and then when the, the wall or the, or the door goes down, he rushes in and fights the Keep Lord. So <clears throat> it's supposed to be a big help to have essentially a Keep Lord on your side of the battle. I just wonder how killable he is, because if he dies as fast as a regular Keep Lord does when a Zerg gets on him, he's going to be no use at all <laughs> to the people that need help well, breaking out. Now the idea is though that this keep lord won't take off until he has a, a at least a, a support of X amount of sure. players. We don't know we don't know quite what that number is yet, but we know that he's not going to go take off on his own. Two questions I have, and I'm probably going to find out very soon, is what kind of loot table does this guy have, <laughs> and uh, what kind of buffs does he actually give? Because a if he provides a great loot table, imagine the mindset of an enemy zerg that wants to get uh try to get precursors or whatever you know or just more <laughs> more rares they will farm this guy okay so that's one thought we've got to take all the towers from blue <laughs> just ignore green who cares we've got to take the, all the towers from blue so that this guy will spawn and then we kill him <laughs> <laughs> right, so they will farm this guy. Now, if he is not farmable because maybe he scales up so incredibly that a 100-man Zerg, which, yes, uh, our servers we're facing have these Zergs anyway, like Sea of Sar our Sanctum of Raw and stuff, they run in these multi-guild mass Zergs. Like, they don't separate. They just run in a mass ball. If I were them, I wouldn't blame them for wanting to farm this particular uh, NPC that runs out of the base. Especially if he has the same loot table as, let's say, like a Tower Lord or something, you know, or a Keep Lord. Um, that said, on the other hand, if this Keep Lord provides full supply, that's a pretty huge... I mean, imagine that, Bridger. You know, you can actually get... Uh, it, it, let's say you knew this this NPC was spawned. Let's talk strategy for a second. If if Team Legacy knew that in the... Oh, no. Let's leave in the one... green. You're going to say, well, let's leave one borderland completely desolate so that we can go there and fill the whole <laughs> guild up with supply before we go to hey, take hey, castle. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> so, <laughs> you just ruined it. You ruined it. I get, hey, I get to get the guests and cool strategies sometimes, you know. <laughs> so, the idea is leave one scout in each borderland, especially the ones you know that you are way outmanned in, because... We always have one or two that are just completely out, man. You leave one scout there, you wait for this NPC to pop up, and then you whisper, you type in guild chat, NPC up, you move all your guys over there, get all the supply, <laughs> go, go back to your map. So this, and, <laughs> one, this one group of pugs who are rallying around this guy, like, yeah, we're going to take back some territory, and then this massive zerg, all of the same guild, yes, they're helping us, we're they're here to help us, let's move out! And they get there, and they turn around, and... Hey, where'd they go? It, you know, I gotta be thinking right now that some arena employees like, damn it, we didn't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they might have thought about that too. Maybe by the time. I mean, even the I mean, even imagine attacking Stomus. Like you attack Stomus, you're out of supply everywhere. It's like, okay, guys, NPC spawn in this borderland. Everybody goes to that borderland. So, like the few little <laughs> groups or players that are there are like all excited. Like, man, we got reinforcements, and they all get their supply and poured out. <laughs> <laughs> And so this NPC starts taking off, and he's left with the three or four guys that are just scratching their head like, okay. So you now know? if they're listening to this, what they're going to do is make it so that if you try to do that, and then you try to leave, it's going to stop you, and it's not going to work. And he's going to point at you and say, coward, you may not leave until we take our objective. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, I mean, that's 
happening, especially by the more organized guilds. There, some of these servers, and I've, I've transferred over, and I've you know I've played that little spy game just to see how they're organized. Some of these guilds and stuff, for better or worse, it may work for them. Great, they will hold the mentality that if you're not going to sit with us and organize with us and go to certain borderlands and such, then you know to heck with you. And they will pop to these maps and they'll see these players there. And these players are needing the help. This NPC is there, and now they're all excited to move out. But they're not there to help the borderland. They're there to help themselves with supply, and then they're going to pour it out. I give it less than a week after it comes out to have one of these individuals that thought they were getting help. They witness this guild come in, take all the supply, and then they all pour it out for them to create a post on some community somewhere complaining about it or yeah. on the official board. Uh, that said, it might not just be that. It might be... Somebody calling out uh, to a map on that a completely different map, saying NPC has spawned at XX Borderland. Everybody goes over there to get supply, and they don't have any intention of actually staying there. So, the concept of this breakout event is great. You know, the idea that we're going to get some NPC help, the the game will help you push out. That's fine, but the the way they're executing it, I think, is a little little. It needs some improvement because it's set up purely right now to be abused by organized guilds and stuff that do have multiple scouts everywhere. Unless, I mean, the only way that this could work is if he just instantly arrives and gives supply to everyone on the map, and you don't have time to organize a group and come or something like that. Maybe. I don't know. But then you could time it. Well, then I'll tell you right now. As soon as the tower I mean, falls, you say, everybody get to that map because the guy's going to spawn in two minutes. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of ways that they could go wrong. The only way they could make it not abusable is to make it so that instead of him, him giving free supply to everybody there, he just goes and builds stuff and you just have to protect him and he'll build the stuff to attack the keep with or the tower or whatever he winds up going after. That seems like the best way to do it. Yeah, but see, let's let's assume he gave supply to everybody. Okay, um, would it be just one time? Would it be you know when would it be? Um, well, as soon as he spawns, you're saying, right? Is that just I'm, a I'm one saying, time I'm or saying, does he? I'm saying instead of him giving supply, he just provides the supply by building the things himself. You know what I mean? Like you just have to protect him. He goes out and builds the stuff instead of giving supply at all. That's the only way to prevent it from being abusable is just not have him give supply. Just yeah, have him provide then... it. Okay, but then if he moves out and he didn't give any supply, how do you expect to take the tower? That's what I'm saying. I mean, he, it, he's moving it, out with you. He builds all the siege to take the tower. Yeah, but, you know, if they're going to do that, they might as well just make World v. World a full-blown Dota game. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then wow. NPCs spawn from every tower and go to different points. I mean, how... That would actually be pretty cool, though. That's a slippery but, slope. We just like, well, if one guy does it in this one specific circumstance, it might as well just be like it's happening everywhere all the time. Yeah, I mean, imagine <laughs> if one of the up, like, imagine if your towers and keeps, uh, during different intervals, spawn X amount of mobs, and you could upgrade that as like one of the upgrades, and they would send waves of like small, like a doliac, you know, and escort it. But instead, these mobs move to other enemy points, much like how if you take over the the quaggan, you know, and they attack randomly or whatever it might be, or the 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 ogres or what have you. Mm -hmm. Imagine if taking a tower, you could actually spawn these little uh, militia forces, you know, that attack. Ah, uh, one can dream, right? Yeah, there's so. all kinds of cool <laughs> stuff that could be done, and I and and maybe even things that they could break up the Zerg. <clears throat> but I think what you identified earlier was the fact that the the maps are smaller than they seem to be is probably the yes. biggest issue. But yeah, anyway, uh, that's that's kind of it that we have as far as world versus world stuff. They again reference that February is the month where we're going to see big changes to world versus world. So we we shall see when that actually occurs. It's only. A, Two months away now, two more patches. We get Winter's Day, we get whatever crazy thing they come up with for January, maybe more Karka. Wouldn't that be great? Um, <laughs> no, no right. that was awful. <laughs> so, what else do we have in the news pile here? Aha! ArenaNet holds a frank Reddit debate on Guild Wars 2 loot grind. Uh, so this this is interesting, and this is this is a, a whole bunch of information. Mike O'Brien says, "quote I wish you would, I wish I wish I would ask you to judge us by details and not by making slippery slope arguments." Unquote. Uh, he's referring to the comments that everybody was made when ascended uh, armor types were added, and people, oh no, it's crazy. And now the last time we talked about this was like two weeks ago, or or right. or, or, or maybe even three weeks ago, uh, and and and. At the time, I was like, I was mollified because at first I was outraged because 
okay, it's a new tier of gear and it seems like a, a you know, gear treadmill gating system like before. Then we learn some of the details and okay, well, it's not gating anything because fractals, you can do all of it without any ascended gear. Okay, that's cool, fine, that's, that's mm -hmm. one plus. And then it turns out you don't really need this gear because there aren't any other dungeons that require that level gear. All the dungeons in the game are, you know, this specific gear. And maybe people in World versus World might be 8% stronger than you. That's still a problem, but it's not so bad. And then I realized that it costs 50 ectos just to get one of these things and then 250 to upgrade it. Are you kidding me? I don't have the time for that. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, they're trying to bridge that gap between, uh, um, as they said, exotics and legendaries, you know, where... Uh, it doesn't take an obscene amount of time, but you know it does take a little time. You can't yeah. just go to the auction house and buy these, um, you know. So that's kind of the the middle gap they're trying to create. The obviously the big deal was that they give a stat increase. Now, I don't think uh, maybe two. Uh, well, actually no, I'll take that back. Maybe like four to eight members in our guild has ascended gear or like the rings and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's definitely doing its job where it's it's available, but it's not, you know, it's not like where everybody can get it. So it's it comes down to really a mix where a lot of these players are, are crying out, um, if you want my opinion, is that they are getting themselves involved with other games on the side of Guild Wars 2 right mm -hmm. now. I think a lot of people are doing that, yeah. whether they admit it or not. They are playing Planet Side, they're playing Far Cry or any one of these other games. And they find themselves with less time in Guild Wars 2 because they get burned out a lot quicker per, you know, sit down. So now they introduce this new tier of gear, which they had mentioned somewhere they had always planned on releasing it. They just never finished it. And these players aren't playing as much anymore. Now, if this was released back when the game launched, everybody would have this Ascent of Gear right now. Everybody. It's possible, um, but, you know, yeah, because, because you'd have more time. But to be right. honest, one of the things that I appreciated about Guild Wars 2 was that the highest tier gear was fairly easy to get and um, to get a full set of ascended gear once they actually let you have the the chest piece and the armor and the weapons and things like that I feel like that is going to take a substantial amount of time and I don't know well, I, I, that kind of rubs me the so, wrong way. So your argument is that you know the the premise of Guild Wars 2 was that you could get you know, on the same level as everybody else relatively easily. Right. And that the Ascension gear is, yeah, I, I could see where you're going with that. Yeah, because that is sort of against what they had, uh, definitely as they pitched the game, you know. Um, I, I can see what they were trying to do with it as well, because I understand that other people have different priorities than me, and for them, they like to have something to work towards and, the, and that kind of a thing. And especially, like, the way that they designed Fractals is a very compelling PvE experience. I mean, the, the other one that I always think of when I think of the way that they've designed Fractals is sort of the last stand mode in uh, Dawn of War 2, uh, the expansion. Uh, it was right. basically set up so that the first time you did it, you have the crappiest level 1 heroes, and you're trying to last as long as possible, and you get as far as, like, wave 4. But then mm. you get new gear when you level up, and that lets you get further. And then that lets you get more gear, which lets you get further, which lets you get more gear, which lets you get further. And it's a survival mode. So it's one of those fun, oh, man, let's see how long we can last. And you got to come up with new tactics, like, oh, this time we've got access to this new piece of gear. Let's see how we can incorporate that. Like it's, So it's a, they're giving you new toys to play with every time. And it's not exactly a good fit for, for what the Ascended Gear, but I think it fills the same niche and the same people who enjoy that kind of thing of, okay, we've got something new, now let's see if we can beat that thing that we couldn't, we could get further than we thought we could before with this new thing available. So I, I right. can see how that, and I really wish the compromise would have been like, no new stats on Ascended Gear, but that infusion thing that only is important in fractals and only would affect people who really like that kind of thing, that would make it something that would still be obtainable and important to obtain for those people, those kinds of people who enjoy that, but not affect everybody else to where I feel like I have to have it or I'm gimped in World vs. World. I don't think people are going to really say anything. Like, I mean, yeah, we do have the very vocal crowd right now, but it's a very small minority. Most people are enjoying the fractals. They enjoy having something else to work towards. I think where you're really going to start really, like, really hearing people cry out about it is when you can get the full set of Ascended Gear, because... 8% increase on just your jewelry, that's that's one thing, right? 
but eight percent increase on your entire set of gear um you know everything you have eight percent increase on six other item slots uh you know that is your armor that's substantial when and, people say and your oh, i'm sorry and your just, weapons yeah and your weapons so on top of that your weapons too um, I think then when people start seeing the numbers, especially, I mean, imagine like a, a, a glass cannon set with that extra increase. Um, I think that's when you're going to really start seeing people speak up. But then again, we have somebody in chat. Um, of course, we love our people in chat because they kind of throw those the info out. Uh, somebody guy named Kong is saying that Arena has already stated that they're going to readdress how you achieve or how you obtain this. So mm -hmm. uh, that's that's good. We'll just have to see how they change it. I know a lot of people in Worldly World want to uh, see a way of getting it. You know, there are a lot of people crying out or speaking out saying like, "Look, I'm riding Worldly World to the end be until the next big MMO comes out." You know. I would like a way to get Ascended Gear in World v. World, and I think Arena has addressed that as well. Yeah. They're going to try to introduce some ways. So this might be one of those things we kind of have to wait and see, but you would, at the same time, you can't really, you know, forgive them for launching it in such a poor manner as yeah, well. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I think if there were more ways to get this stuff up front that weren't, you know, more available to more types of players... And it wasn't. It didn't seem so damn expensive because there are people that make the argument, well, oh, it's it's only like eight percent. That's not a lot. And then you say, oh, so you were okay yeah. playing in rares before then? Is that okay? Is that you, you didn't feel <laughs> tell, compelled? Tell a wow, tell a wow player that eight percent is. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't feel compelled to get exotics when everybody else was running in exotics. You just stuck around with rares because why waste your money on eight percent? It does. Yeah, and it does. Right now, it's inconsequential because it's just maybe two pieces. You know, your couple rings, right. maybe a back piece. Not many people can even have it or get it. So right now, it's inconsequential. People are worried about the future. I, I hope that I, – I, I, have, I have confidence that ArenaNet has heard that issue. And like you said, they're going to provide more ways around that. So that's, yep. that's very cool. So that's, that just was a matter very, of how long. Exactly. That's a very interesting uh, post there. Definitely get, recommend you guys check that out. So this is one of the funniest things I have seen. Now, I know you can't see – what I have here, but I think you've got a link there. I'll send it over to you too, in case you don't have it. Now this. Yeah, I got it. Okay, so this is a post <laughs> entitled "Rangers Are Overpowered," and I'm just going to briefly show you this YouTube video here. Uh, what you see here is a ranger firing his bow in rapid fire, just single like one shot over and over again at an enemy who's just dodging back and forth. And every single arrow is missing, and this goes on for 30 seconds straight. Not a single arrow hits this because he just goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now, people in the thread challenged him and said, yes, well, you know, that was just, he wasn't even firing back at you. So he said, oh, ho, oh, well, let me show you this, where both are firing, and here the ranger is missing every single time, and yet is getting hit by the elementalist every single time. Single time. That stupid elementalist has a homing beacon on his static shocks there. What is that electricity? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. And the, the pet keeps intercepting and taking some of the chain lightning, which then bounces to the caster. <laughs> you can't make your pet dodge. <laughs> oh, elementalists are awesome. Um, so then, to hammer this home even further, I don't even remember what the last one was, but I remember it being just as funny if I... Oh, yes! <laughs> This is this is somebody trying to this is this is supposedly the pet with a with a, an agility training that makes them move 30% faster. I'll try and crank up the quality here. And the guy does nothing but runs in a circle and the pet pathing can never catch him. Never <laughs> once catches him. He's slamming on the attack button over and over again and never touches him. He just runs in a circle. There's no swiftness there. He's just running in a circle. Rangers are clearly overpowered. I feel I feel for you, Ranger brothers. I feel for you. What was that? Oh, no. That was my Team Legacy thing. I'm going to have to fix that. All right. Anyway, so, yeah. I've heard Rangers are getting some love in the patch. Uh, I saw some notes with that, so that's good news. I just thought I'd share that. If you haven't seen that, guys, check out the show notes. TalesOfTeary.com is where you can find them. Uh, they are awesome. All right, so this is a very interesting article. Colin Johansson on the future of Guild Wars 2. Uh, this is a, a big, big article on GamingBolt.com. They sat down with, uh, I believe, 
Uh, this is Colin Johansson, and I had a whole big conversation with him. Uh, I, I definitely recommend you guys read it, read through it. It's got some really interesting stuff, some insights. However, some of the quotes that I took out that were very interesting uh, is, quote, actually in February we're going to have a whole bunch of expansions on top of that world, world versus world area to make that experience more even more uniquely Guild Wars. He had just preceded this by talking about realm versus realm in Dark Age of Camelot and how they were heavily influenced by this. So he's... He's implying that they're going to do something to World vs. World to even distinguish it more, something that uh, Dark Age of Camelot never did or that some, some other game hasn't done before. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, he also said, quote, January and February are the biggest updates to date. They are even bigger than the stuff we did in October, November, and December. And I think that when p they, people see how much stuff they're going to get for no monthly fee in January and February, they're probably going to be blown away. These two months combined are basically an expansion's worth of content for free. Wow. Wow. You know, <laughs> I, I'm going to be the bad guy here, Bridger. I'm sorry. But how many times, I mean, have we heard this from Colin uh, regarding a number of things, like with structured PvP, for example? I, I mean, where in that message do I see spectator mode? You know, where... Uh, where do I see uh, fixing the calling? You know, where to? What I do see in that message, I'll, I'll decipher it for you. Okay, <laughs> I see, I, I see jumping puzzles, PVE content, and more unique skins. That's what I see out of that message. Now, I have like a man crush on Colin, but <laughs> I, I think he's literally reading from a script that somebody else wrote, because I don't see the. Um, you know the stuff that the players are really screen. You, you don't. It doesn't take long to read the forums, right? right? Structure PVP. The scene is is might as well be dead. It, you got a, a few good groups and good teams trying to keep it alive. Props to you guys. Okay, really. But it's the stuff that they had said that they were going to work on. H how many months are we into the game now, Bridger? Uh, Where? Well, we had August, so September, October, November, December. About four. Yeah. Four. Almost four. And, and where are we talking about some of the stuff, you know? So, I guess, uh, you know, I'm not going to... I love the Guild Wars 2. It is the best MMO. It deserved all the Game of the Year awards it just got, by the way. Oh, yeah? But in terms of PvP, I think they've abandoned those that tried to play Guild Wars 2 truly for the PvP. In this, in this uh, update, I'm going to be out there running that PvE content. I'll, we're going to have a good time. We're going to have a blast. We're going to remember it just as much as I remember the Halloween jumping puzzle, which mm -hmm. was freaking awesome. But at the end of the day, once this is, uh, once this content is pretty much burned through, the carcass stuff, for example, when are you ever going to go back there, Bridger? You know, I, like, well, just the I mean, other day, I thought and, about maybe in order to get the Ori Calcum, I might go <laughs> back there. <laughs> I mean, everybody ask yourselves, you've done the Karka event, you've gotten your little shell, you've gotten your 20-slot box, you've gotten all of that, or if you didn't get it, you got it for free, <laughs> you got a chest, because yeah. I never did it, I just randomly got a chest a few days ago. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I, I got a chest that had all the rewards in it. Yeah. I got I got a exotic which I immediately turned around and sold for nine gold. I got a twenty slot box and yep. like it came out of nowhere. And, I'm and like, a really nice okay. accessory, yes. Yeah, and and some yeah little shell accessory. <laughs> but anyway, Barry Quinn in the chat got two of those. You got two full rewards. Oh man, <laughs> double the chance of precursor. But aside from that, anybody who's actually done that event, who's going to go back to that area? Like, really. Yeah. Well, you can Cr say, that about, right now. say that about anything. Nobody, nobody wants to go back to ore, but they have to because right. it's the only way they can get now, anything. Uh, on a, in a statistical basis, how many people go back to structure PvP? How many people go back to World v. World? How many second so chances I th I think, do people... I think what you're getting at here is that the multiplayer component or other players provide longer lasting content than can ever be provided from AI. Is that sort of the, the argument that we're going for here? Right. I just think that, um, you know, I, I'm, no, I'm sort of rambling, but I think that the PvP side of the game is really where they need to just sit aside 20 people in that office and say, look, there is a large contingency of players here. This is also, by the way, ArenaNet, your main source of streamers, your uh, 
your esports scene, everybody looking in on the game, the news. Uh, as far as streaming in general, that's one of the easiest ways to advertise your game. People stream World v. World. Uh, people stream Structure PvP. If you get more people involved in that, more people excited in that, you're helping your business out. Um, you know, I just think finding out more ways to sell gems in the gem store in the short term may be great because you're trying to sell quickly to those that are still playing the game. But in the long term, you got to focus more on the multiplayer aspects. And the multiplayer, unless you're going to release a 10, 20 man dungeon, it's not in PvP or PvE. I'm sorry. It's in PvP. And getting more people involved in World v. World and actually pushing out these updates that should have been out three months ago. Uh, structure PvP updates, for example, the esports stuff, spectator, uh, actually having you know stats, you know for structure PvP, uh, long-term stats. I'm speaking armory links, stuff stuff that other MMOs have made standard. Um, is it's just it, it's coming to that point now where it's like, okay, we know you have a great story writing team. We know your voice actors and your uh, the those that write the NPC scripts. Um, citizens, you know, uh, <laughs> they're great. They really are. They're witty. They're they're artistic. They're fantastic. But let's try to spread some of that love over to other areas of the game before those people truly just give up on it altogether. That's that's kind of my thing about about this update. Now they mentioned a big world v world thing, you know, for what is it February? February. Right? Yep. So, just real quickly, what do you think this world v world update could possibly have? Ah. Uh... I, I think the possibilities extend to maybe a new map. There might have, they, they might, but that, that seems very unlikely. Um, yeah, potentially, potentially changes to the way that the that world versus world works in order to try and make it deeper or more interesting. Because those kinds of changes would have been the kind that would take this long, either. NPC, uh, you know, thing like you were talking about before, something like NPC uh, patrols and moves and attacking on their own, those kinds of pr things that require a lot of programming are the kinds of things that could have taken this long. Um, maybe a, a real solution to the culling issue, some kind of system in place that rewards better, uh, more, you know, more organi organized smaller groups maybe. Uh, it, 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 now, I can't think of anything that's like, like oh, it's definitely going to be this. The, the key thing to take away from this, though, and it, it's very uniquely worded, just like this, just like they use the word uniquely, is, quote, to make that experience even more uniquely Guild Wars. Now, I know you didn't play a lot of Guild Wars, Bridger, yourself, but those in the chat, just, just throwing out some random thoughts here, what do you think they mean by to make that experience more uniquely Guild Wars. Could we possibly see more focus on the guild aspect of World v. World, like guild organization? Yeah, that would, they, they also um, mentioned, I think... I, I just think that last sentence is put there for a reason. I, yeah. think, he was, I think he was snickering when he wrote it. And I, I think that there is... <laughs> guild capes. What, what we're going to see... No, they'll never do guild capes. I'll tell you why guild capes won't work, because of char. I'm sorry. <laughs> they just won't ever work because of Char. Cause, and they've you, said they that already. They would have a giant billowing cape or a <laughs> tiny thing that looked way too small. It's one or the other. The, the, the reason why a lot of the stuff like back pieces, people wonder all the time, why won't it work, uh, is because of Char. <laughs> <laughs> because they have a giant tail. And in many cases, other various things, depending on what you're, what you're setting yourself up as. Um, and they've said it because of that. So I don't see well where we'll ever get capes unless, like they've done with armor, they design a cape that you know is different per, per race. But anyways, back to the thing. I, I think that what most people need to kind of theorycraft right now is the fact that they say an experience more uniquely Guild Wars. Now, Guild Wars PvP, okay, you had... Uh, basically GVG, which was the main competitive focus. That was essentially you could take uh, a group of guild members, um, this was really big at certain times uh, throughout its history, and go against other set guild groups in kind of like what would seem like a, um, a battleground, but a little bit larger. You had two keeps and such, and you had to kill each other. I don't see how that can play into World v. World unless they focused more on maybe the guilds claiming ownership or customizing a tower or keep. 
I um, say yes, yes. That's what we need. We need towers and keeps. When a guild claims ownership, they can expand it. They can add a library and a basement <laughs> and a special special siege towers. And then you get a, a sally port out the back so you can come charging with, with mounts that you can ride uh, in no, there no, with Let me slow you down here. Oh, let me okay. slow you down. A library? Well, oh, you have what? to... You have to <laughs> How do you st how do you study Sun Tzu without loads of books <laughs> <laughs> to study just... the the strategies of war? Like you read this book and it gets you like one tick closer to a commander icon, and you have to actually read it and then answer a test afterwards. Like the mesmer uses this ability to help allies resurrect friendlies, and you're like, oh, quick to Wikipedia! No, it was timed. I lost. Oh no! I don't know. I it, that's. That's the library expansion coming soon to a guild yep. horse near you. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just something I'm curious about. First thing I'm going to look for in February is to see what makes this more like Guild Wars. And is that a good or a bad thing? Because, uh, you know, hate to, hate to say it, but Guild Wars did kind of take off, did great, and then plummeted. Um, so, you know, what exactly are they taking from Guild Wars? Because Guild Wars did a lot of things great. That no other MMO and, is still. And they still, might have, they might know. have, like my my first interpretation. You you might be right that that might be pulling from the original game. But as somebody pointed out in the chat, it might be possible they just mean more uniquely Guild Wars, as in more hours, more of the Guild Wars franchise, rather than we copied this from Realm versus Realm. You know, and and so what what they what it seems to me they'd be saying there is we're providing you with something new in February that you haven't seen before in the other games that are this mode was influenced by. I kind of get that impression. I doubt it's going to be oh, we're seeing orbs come back in a new form. It's going to be great. You're going to want to capture now, these things. Somebody in chat, uh, Zeriki, uh, brings up a good point. Maybe. Maybe I'm taking this out of context. Maybe they just mean Guild Wars in terms of the lore or something. Yeah. Like, not necessarily the first game, you know, but just uniquely the franchise. And if that's the case, maybe it's just kind of a bunch of fluff, you know? Yeah. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. I mean, obviously, them saying January, February, this content's bigger than Halloween and stuff. I mean, Halloween had a lot in it. Yeah. And Winter's Day is obviously going to have a lot in it. it. That's a major focus. Uh, Um, you know, whether World v. World is still stagnant and stuff, I'm still going to be playing. You're still going to be playing. <laughs> and 99% yeah. of those complaining, saying, I'm done with Guild Wars 2, they're going to be logging in. So, <laughs> so you know, that's what we're, what we're looking at right now. I just hope that ArenaNet with this big World v. World patch, if they say it's going to be a big patch and it's going to be, you know, it's going to do things, uh, you know, bring a whole bunch of new stuff to it and maybe fix things, they actually do that, you know, because a lot yeah. of game companies fall into that trap. You and I both know, Bridger, where they hype it up, hype it up, hype it up, but then it's like, you know, they change two things, you know, and mm -hmm. it's not as much as you thought it would be. Uh, and, and even that can happen to the best of companies, too, because maybe right now... ArenaNet has some big ambitious plans for what they're going to do to revitalize or add depth to the strategic concert, or make guilds more important, whatever, to World vs. World, but... Come February, it turns out it took a lot more programming than they expected, or they ran into some problems technically rendering the certain amount of things on the screen, or or their ideas took too much number crunching and the servers overloaded. So turns out they're gonna have to push it back two months, and or, or maybe never because it was just too ambitious. And we get some tiny stupid thing. It's not necessarily hey. because they promised things they weren't planning on delivering. Sometimes you promise things and find out in programming that it took longer than you thought. Look, I would just like an official answer on an iPad app or an Android app that allows me to see World v. Yeah. World and see where the players are. I don't know where that went, but if that's part of this patch, I'll throw my money at them. I mean, <laughs> it, I mean if you have to buy it through the gem store to have access, I'll buy it. I mean, you, you remember that? Remember that picture? I don't know if we could pull up an image or something, but that picture of, like, the iPad, and I, it had to be Photoshopped. Yeah. Um, where you could actually, it had a picture of the old Stone Mist. I, I forget what it was called back then. Um, Castle Bailey. How Castle Bailey, Castle thank you. Bailey. It had a picture of Castle Bailey on, on, on an iPad screen, and you uh, the I idea was that you were, you were able to... This is the one you're to, referencing here. Yeah, I believe. Um, the idea was that you could... Um, you know, see your players and maybe not do everything, you know, in game, but you could do the basics. You could see, you could chat with your guild. Where did that go? If that's part of this patch, if that's something they've been just secretly working on, like, you know, 
conniving and we're just going to release it under you know make everybody super excited great but i you know i would like to hear more about that i think if they if they're going to do something big for february finish that up i mean that was like the coolest that was one of the biggest things i think for a lot of people i mean chat speak up you know that when you saw it when you were reading about guild wars 2 when you were learning about it and you saw that idea of using your smartphone to chat with your guild and stuff that was pretty cool i mean that was uniquely quote unquote uniquely guild wars at the time mm -hmm. and um you know i think wow has something like that now you know um they may have taken it from guild wars but regardless uh, I'd like to see that in the update. That'd be kind of like on my wish list, you know, if I could ask Santa for something. <laughs> yep, absolutely. So, having said that, Winter's Day is almost upon us. And we have a Winter's small Day. preview here. Did you see this yet? I have not. No, tell me about it. All right. So, I unfortunately I can't send it to you. Let me let me let me just send you the link. You can watch along with us here. They do what they can to avoid the oncoming gloom. Hang lanterns and mistletoe, and go about spreading. Now that looks like new town clothes right there. They had sort of wintry-looking right. town clothes. Brand new lion's arch statue. Instead of a lion, you got a crazy snow globe. And this giant blimp is just the coolest. Damn it, arena net! Why are you so awesome? And look at that jumping puzzle. Look at like that I jumping said, puzzle. Like I said, they have some of the most awesome artistic and creative directors and members uh, you will find in the industry. Yeah. No, no doubt about that. I will never, for a second, doubt that. It's, it's I mean, amazing. And I, I mean, you know, you know, what would just cap this all off. Like, if sometime during Christmas or maybe next year we get like some new stuff put out by Jeremy Soul or something, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to match all of this. I mean. Did they? I, I can't quite remember, but did they have anything custom for the Halloween stuff? I think during the jumping puzzle, there was a, a song that played. Yes, or, they did uh, have theme. a custom. They had two customized so, songs. One was for the the Mad King, and the other one was for the jumping puzzle. If I'm not mistaken. Right. So, so can you imagine like a, uh, <laughs> kind of like a, a a parody Christmas song for Guild Wars Two? Well, you mean, know, we I'm kind of heard we haven't that seen in... it yet for on YouTube. Yeah, there, I mean, there, it's not a full you know Christmas song, but if you listen to this. That's yeah, you in hear, the background. You, you can definitely yeah. hear something similar to how the Halloween one sounded, but but definitely different and more upbeat and Christmassy rather than sort of uh, sort of uh, you know off key and and evil sounding and scary. You know, is is much more. Yeah, and you know, I keep forgetting though that you know the reason they call it Winter's Day is because they want it kind of to be non-denominational. Right, and that's right, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do they have you seen a Santa hat or anything like that? Um, Wagon all. with a Santa hat. Actually, it, did they update their 404 page yet? Do you remember looking at if you looked at during the Guild Halloween, Wars 2 yeah. and during the Karka update, they showed the Karka on or not the uh, the Quagon on the beach. Hang on, let me see. 404.html is that it? Let's see if that's updated now. No, that's not it. What is? Anybody know what the actual? Is it just slash 404? Oh, I can't find it. <laughs> How can I not find the 404? Uh, so EN those slash. those watching, what Bridger's trying to find is that when you load something on Arena.net um, or on the Guild Wars website, and it's like an invalid link, it'll bring you to what's called a 404 page, just like any other website. But ArenaNet customizes theirs with these little crazy designs and stuff, and it's really awesome. It, and they change it all the time. Yeah. So if you guys uh, get a chance during this Winter's Day thing. Um, you know, tr check out their 404. They have, like, a new design every time. I would not be surprised if they update it to something here in the next couple weeks. I can't believe I can't find it on Google on uh, Google Image Search. The the Halloween one was great, and then they had one for the Karka, too, that I can't. Anyway, this is their normal 404. Kind of looks like this. It's just got a Quaggan holding a 404 sign, and it's says, <laughs> Foo! Quaggan cannot find page! Quaggan has been looking, but Quaggan cannot <laughs> find your page. Only 404. Quaggan's sad. And it makes you feel bad for typing in a URL. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, Quaggan. <laughs> I didn't mean to make you look that hard. I'll type better next time. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? No, because I just get a weird EN thing when I click on that link. Maybe that. Maybe they're updating it right now, and that's why we can't see it. Anyway... Uh, the, the there is actually the Winter's Day page itself is up right now if you want to check that out I, I think that actually came out today along with that video if I'm not mistaken 
and it basically has the video. There's new Winter's Day items in the gem store, as would be expected. Uh, they also have this schedule of events. Uh, so this is not quite like the Karka event, where it's like, you have to be there or else. Uh, there, there is going to be, I think, in Lion's Arch, it says, Snowball Mayhem, uh, Winter's Day Celebration Begins, Interior All Over the Mists. Lion's Arch is really the place to be. So again, they're kind of putting everything in there. Uh, maybe maybe some of this is is happening elsewhere too it's it's interesting they don't have they have snow is lion's arch gonna be snowy like that's weird that's weird i can't imagine it always looks like a tropical sort of place with sand and beaches yeah but, it does uh, you're right but then they have on the on the next one two three four five days uh you have ticks the the sort of toy maker the a surin toy maker bringing his giant floating uh, golem uh airship to the various cities and this is actually brilliant because this will actually make people go to the capital <laughs> cities wait there's a divinity's reach where the humans have a capital <laughs> yeah they do <laughs> i thought the capital was lion's arch isn't the lion's yeah. arch the capital of tyria <laughs> <laughs> so this is really cool it's brilliant and i wonder if there are different things at each city or if like it's just hey if you're logging on on this day that's the city to go to you know, they just need to make it where nothing happens in Lion's Arch, <laughs> where it all happens in these other cities. That because would be then great. people will get more than 10 FPS. Yeah. It'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> I kid. I kid, Arena Net. Uh, so, Toy Apocalypse is on December 20th to Lion's Arch. I believe this is probably some very specific event happening then. But look at all the they've got screenshots and 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 concept art. What is this? This is ridiculous. They got they got such cool looking stuff. Floating presents, a giant snowball chasing char. Oh, that's scary. Um and and I have to say, and is there a link is there there's no thing here, but there there was a really cool looking jumping puzzle in there in that video. It only comes up for about a half a second, but it is cool looking and I can't wait to dig into that. So, anyway, we're just talking about over and over stuff you can see on the web on the website. If you go to guildwars2.com right now, you can see it if you're, you know, listening to this at any time in Oh yeah, in and we'll uh in a later episode, I'm sure we'll dive on into it and what makes it awesome. Oh, that's right. That's cause... exactly what we're doing next week. Uh, the next time we come on, which is going to be the 23rd of December, which is after right. all this crazy awesome stuff has happened, uh, es essentially, because it doesn't look like it goes past the 20th in terms of specific events. So we'll be able to talk about all the cool stuff that happened uh, in Lion's Arch and in the other cities, whatever happens. So anyway, that's going to be awesome. Let's move on to the mailbag. Uh, we've got Mysticon saying, uh, quote, there is a lot of class fix slash balance that only affect PvP and not PvE. He's talking specifically structured PvP. Uh, he says, quote, do you think this is also should be applied to world versus world? Unquote. That's a very interesting question, Mysticon. So in case you're not aware, if you look at the patch notes very closely, uh, in the last few big patches that we've seen over the last few months, uh, there have been very subtle small things that say, for PvP, this ability now only does 10% instead of 20%, or only stuns for one second instead of two, or only lasts for four seconds instead of 10. So they're, they're nerfing specific, uh, you know, really powerful abilities that are in PvP, but not in PvE. And world versus world is not affected by those. The question is, should they be? That's a really interesting question. I don't think it's that big of a deal because world versus world has a lot less one on one you and me or even two on two in small skirmish fights where these kinds of small number changes really matter. I don't know, what do you think freelancer? I agree I agree with you there. Um I mean PvE up until now has always been same kind of skills, you know, everything as world v world. You know, that was the idea and then I'm hearing the same thing where certain skills are being tweaked but they don't affect world v world. Um it's it's world v world. I mean, it really comes down to right now. Uh, you know, I'm just gonna say it right now. If you don't zerg, you don't win. And it's you can try to split off and stuff, but with these orange swords everywhere and with uh, these servers that are basically zerg to win, it, little things like the you know the minute things that are being changed now in the patch notes. I've read them. It doesn't affect large scale. It, it really comes down to I have 40 people, you have 80 people, you win. That that's just what it is because there's AOE caps 
for one. And there's, uh, well, it's just, that's kind of what it is. Right now, to take down doors or upgrade things, you got to have more, amount, more amounts of people. Um, and unfortunately, that's the way the games play. Now, as they improve World v. World and they try to focus more on groups splitting apart and having, like, I mean, I know we still run small groups, and I know a lot of other guilds do, but, like, with a small group, um, and let's say they go up against another small group because ArenaNet encourages this small skirmish warfare, then it's going to matter. Then players are going to kind of, you know, well, you reduce stun length on this, but why didn't you remove it in World v. World? And then players are going to pick that up in World v. World and start abusing that. They'll actually pay attention to the patch notes and... Um, you know, that change PvE type things and see, okay, well, if this was really powerful against these types of mobs or, or mobs in general, then they must be somewhat, you know, equivalent to a certain extent in World v. World, and they're going to focus on those. I think, honestly, they just need to, um, you know, as far as balancing World v. World, little patch changes like this aren't really a big deal. It, it's the big things, like the mm -hmm. meta changers, like AoE caps, you know, got to go on siege equipment. Uh, calling has to be fact. Uh, fixed. The, these things have to be done first before we worry about the little things because calling, I mean, let's be, let's be honest here, calling and uh, AOE in general, I mean, I'm shooting an arrow cart that the sprite, I think it's a sprite anyway, launches into the air about 50 arrows or more. Like, you can't count them. There's so many arrows. But when they all land and you see hundreds of arrows hitting a little circle, five people... Uh, um, things like that, or a trebuchet shot or a catapult shot. You, you aim it perfectly. We all know how hard it is to hit you know, actual people with catapult or a trebuchet. You nail it, but it hits five people. You know, and the rest of them are like, brush it off, you know, and like, no, no big deal. Yeah. Um, I just think Siege needs to have more prominence. They got to fix those bigger things before they fix the smaller things is what I'm getting Absolutely. at. Absolutely. And, and to be honest, I remember when they described – like trebuchets for the first time they said we just put this new this is like way back it before we even got into the press beta like when they were first revealing world versus world and they showed you a screenshot of that massive fireball going at uh at at, at stone mist and you're like that's amazing and they're describing it and they're like when this thing lands it'll flatten 20 people and you're like yes that's so great because these things are so hard to fire and it could just and people are attacking and i can't imagine that one time when it really counts and there's tons of people at the door and you get that perfect launch just as they destroy your siege and it blows away 20 people and then you look at it and even if you're caught in the blast and you're one of those five people you're just like okay i just i heal <laughs> Like, yep. And then I step over here because he won't hit the same place again. And it, you don't even have to dodge it. it. It doesn't even knock you back. Like, I feel I, like uh, if you get hit by a trebuchet, you should get knocked back. And anybody without a lot of toughness or vitality should just be insta-downed, if you ask Yeah, me. And, I, and I remember uh, more than a couple times over the last couple months, uh, players saying, trap shot incoming, because, like, they set up a trap and they're trying to hit our group of players. And we always blow it off. It's like, oh, don't worry about it. It's just a trap. <laughs> you know, you know, or don't worry about it. It's just catapult. I mean, they're like, "What do you mean?" Well, it's only going to hit five of us. It can't hit the same five twice in a row. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so you know, why worry about it? Because if it hits once, it's going to hit five people. That yeah, they're going to be hurt. Trebs do yeah, a decent amount of damage, but trebs take three shots to kill a glass cannon. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And all right, number one, the the treb has to hit the same five people, or at least one of those five people have to get hit three times in a row. And the Treb actually has to hit that spot three times in a row. It's just right now, Siege is, I mean, you tell me a person that is genuinely, you, you, you introduce me to a World v. World player or a guild that is genuinely afraid of Trebs or Catapults or Ballista, and I'm going to call you out as a liar because right now, not a scrap. I mean, in any, most other games, uh, Siege was something to be feared. In real life, Siege was something to be feared. If you saw a ballista in front of you, I mean, uh, I know back before they added these new AOE caps, a ballista would tear through a Zerg. The idea of a ballista, at least for Team Legacy in the early game, was to counter Zergs. If we knew a Zerg was approaching yeah. us, we'd set up these ballistae. I know you remember it, Bridger, and we would just eat away. Like, it would hit everybody in a line. They'd all die, and it was, it was beautiful. It, now, it really actually you know, made a lot of different more interesting sieges because right now the way it works is zerg bangs on the door zerg inside 
if they have enough AOE, they can stand on the wall and force the first Zerg back and they and the first Zerg, the attackers lose. If instead the first Zerg has enough AOE to keep them off the walls, then, you know, okay, then they bust through the door and now you just have essentially a field battle on the other side because Siege is essentially pointless. I mean, maybe you'll have some, some ballistae in the back that are trying to do some work there, but I remember, and I described this on one of the Tales of Tyria, this is, I think, beta weekend number three, great I and a couple other TL along with a couple of pugs, like maybe 10, 12 people in total, defending this, this bastion, our last stand tower, for as long as we could that. against a yep. Zerg, about three or four four times and what the zerg had to do in order to get in was a lot more elaborate and coordinated and interesting they had to set up a catapult outside of our range to try to knock down walls but also they had to get somebody sighting it so that it would be able to hit our our uh, ballistae so that we would eventually get slowly whittled down to the point where we couldn't build any new ballistae and they could get in so it was it was a slow attrition actual siege warfare it wasn't this okay we only need Siege to bust down the door, and so this is a temporary bl break before we're allowed to fight each other. That's kind of what it feels right. like right now. And and I think also uh, it sort of takes away from, I mean, talking about balance again. I mean, do you ever really see epic open field battles? You usually don't. It's just typically whoever has the larger Zerg rolls over the other side. That's that. I mean... A lot of guilds, ours included, and many others, we're not the only ones, will try different tactics to portal bomb, you know, try to guardian wall and divide their groups in half and such. And, you know, a lot of Sun Tzu type tactics, and they work to a certain point, but uh, uh, there's a word for it in StarCraft, so I tip my tongue. Uh, but where you, get a where you get a certain amount, and it just doesn't matter at that point, you can just... Press your A key, the attack key, and move into an enemy base because you have the the amount you need. So that kind of how that's kind of how it works in Guild Wars. And the problem is more and more players are seeing that, and siege equipment just doesn't have a role. Whereas I remember in beta and stuff going back, uh, we would set up arrow carts and ballistae right in the middle of the battlefield, in the middle of the fight, because you those were like battle turners, you know, you could turn and you then had one to side or another. Those, and that became a strategic objective of the battle, which really right. brought a little bit more tactical depth to it. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this World v. World change. I think, though, they're making one mistake, just kind of end on this World v. World note, they're making one mistake saying this, Bridger, and that is that this is their big patch. Okay? Now, if they flunk this, mm. that, will be, that will be it yeah. for, for anybody that is sticking around or reconsidering, kind of saying, okay, Arena Net, we're going to wait. I, I almost, while it's exciting that they announced it, and I'd probably be hypocritical and say the opposite if they didn't announce it, I'd be complaining all like they didn't, you know, but if they don't do this right, if they don't fix culling, if they don't fix, um, you know, things that not just we talk about on the podcast, but what other, a lot of people talk about in there, forums. There's that other thing where people can actually jump up walls. You can get a mesmer. That there's a, there's this trick. Oh, don't get me I started. I don't even understand. Yeah. They can just jump <laughs> up a wall and then portal the whole team over. There's no siege required, and it can happen at a lot of different places. It's something that needs a lot of work to fix. Apparently, it's something in the geometry of the map, and some weird bug in the way the physics works. So that's something that needs to be fixed too. If anybody's yep. going to take anything serious. Criti critical mass, Dervig, uh, was the word I was looking ah, for. Yes. Thank you. Um, but yeah, just. Ending that note, if they just need to make sure they do it. it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Nobody expects Arena Net to be perfect, though they they are in a lot of areas. <laughs> um, but in terms of PvP, they just have to do a, a solid work to give some, you know, some inspiration to those that do play Guild Wars 2 more for the PvP than PvE. Yeah, yeah. So I I agree with you entirely. If the if the February patch does not provide a significant amount of improvements in depth. A lot of people are just going to be, well, that was a good run. Uh, I don't see this getting any better. I'm going to go play Planetside. I'm going to go play this while I'm waiting for Elder Scrolls or some other game to come out. So anyway, uh -huh. I, have, I have a lot of hope and confidence in ArenaNet, and we'll see how much actually gets done by February. It's, it's been a long time since anything was really added to World vs. World. I mean, World vs. World right now is pretty much the state it was in 
back in beta weekend number one, with the exception of, okay, they moved the Keep Lord from Castle, uh, Stone Mist Castle down to the first level, and Siege doesn't hit everybody anymore. That's pretty much the changes to World vs. World. There have been small fixes here and there. They've tried to get rid of the hackers and stuff. That's all great, but as far as big sweeping changes to improve and add features and depth to the World vs. World environment, it feels like it's really lacking. So, anyway, uh, we did uh, actually get another message, uh, another mailbag from Jacobin saying uh, I'd be interested in the decline of structured PvP. I think we got ahead of ourselves there earlier. We kind of talked about structured PvP as it is. It's on life support, yeah. I guess you could say, if anything. It is. I mean, I'll, I'll kind of sum it up. I'm, I'm very involved with it. Um, I work with Arena Junkie and do a lot of help over there and they've bounced around and obviously Curse in general is is doing a lot of work in terms of Guild Wars 2 structured PvP. Uh, just summing it up, uh, I'm, I'm going to hold back my statements because I've recently had a meeting with some members of Curse that are way up the food chain there and also some in the community. Obviously we had our own structured PvP team as well and they're talking and I'm getting a lot of new feedback on different things that potentially may be coming out. So I'm going to withdraw my comments on that. I know a lot of people were asking, but um, right now what we're, what we're looking at is that a lot of teams have left because they've already given up on it. Um, a lot of the teams that you, that you knew of that when we all kicked off in the beginning of the, you know, August uh, have since, you know, dissolved or they've, kind of migrated and formed it's kind of like servers merging you know servers yeah. slowly die in an mmo so they merge that's a lot what's happening right now in yeah. structure pvp um is it dead completely is is it permanently dead no I don't, I don't think it is but um with league of legends and dota 2 coming out and um with a lot of these big games that are that are esports i mean they are in essence esports and especially i guess i should say with dota a lot a lot of these teams are moving to those games because let's be honest here esports is money you know esports is sponsorships esports is viewers um, it doesn't take anybody it doesn't take much effort for anybody to go to twitch right now go to owned.com uh, uh, go to uh, justin go to any one of these and go look at your guild wars 2 streams okay look at the viewers they're getting now at the same time pop over to league of legends okay Pop over to Dota. Pop over to a variety of other games. Um, does that make Guild Wars 2 a lesser game in terms of competitive, um, you know, the atmosphere? Not really. Not in terms of the meta. But it does because there's not any support for it. And whereas you are getting support for League of Legends and Dota. So they're, the players, the teams, the official, um, the official esports aspect they're always going to go where the money is. They sat around waiting for Guild Wars 2 to kick off the, the spectator scene to kick off. Spectator mode, I already went into that. Yeah. It's not there. And those players, a lot of those players rely on, um, I mean, I, I'm very involved with Team Liquid and stuff. I tell you right now, a lot of professional StarCraft 2 players, they rely on that stream revenue to, to keep them afloat. If they're not winning tournaments, they're either co they're offering coaching services for money or they're holding a part-time job while also offering coaching services but the one of the big things and we all know like there's people like total biscuit and such that all do this very well stream revenue ad revenue mm -hmm. and right now if you launch a guild wars 2 stream it's not because the players aren't great it's not because the the teams aren't performing really well or that it's not necessarily a watchable sport it's because the the player base, those that don't play structure PvP, that like the what the spectator, I guess the um, the spectator base is not there, and that's because there hasn't been any support for it. And because of the spectator base is not there, there's no viewers, and with no viewers, there's no income for esports players, and with no viewers also, there's no sponsorships. A company is not going to put money into tournaments that they do not get a return in. Don't let anybody kid you into thinking that. They're going to, oh, we're going to do it just to help out Guild Wars 2. No, they're going to do it for money. They're going to do it for viewers. And they're going to do it for as many people that can see their logo as possible. And right now, they cannot do that in Guild Wars 2. So that's the current state of affairs. Uh, whether ArenaNet uh, supports that and tries to kick that off, we'll see. But a lot of players and a lot of teams right now are doubting that at this point. Yep, yep. So, yeah, we'll see. Like I said, it's, kinda, it's like on life support. It's not dead yet. 
If there were no, it's not a dead. lot of big updates to it, like if we got a spectator mode, uh, if the new map came out officially, and specifically spectator mode and the ability to host custom matches to allow for tournaments or, you know, third-party uh, leagues to be set up, that is really what's required in order to get some juice back into it. So we'll see, well, we'll just, see if that just happens. Just the basics, you know, custom matches. I mean, you right now you still... Unless you find a, an empty server, you still cannot set up scrimmages. You can't set up mock tournaments very well. Uh, you can't really do any of that right now, and that's all basic stuff. It really is basic, mm -hmm. um, and that's what they need to do. Will when they when they finally release that stuff, like spectator mode and stuff, will it kick off? I I I'm as optimistic as the structure of PvP peers that say it's not dead yet. You know, I do think it will kick off. It'll be big, and those that have stuck it out to the end, great. You know, really great. But right now, uh, there is that line, Bridger. We all know what it is. Where do I stick with the game, or or do I move on? You know, and the, if you're getting paid to play, uh, that's a pretty serious question. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. So we, we're 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 running a little longer than I expected. We, you know, when you get Bridger and Freelancer <laughs> on a Bridger podcast, and Freelancer show. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. So yeah. I I wanted to briefly cover a very interesting topic that was sort of. You know, we talked a lot about world versus world today. We talked a lot about structured PvP. This is more about from the PvE angle of things. And it's a post on Reddit called Sick and Tired of the Current Meta Game. And this has 690 upvotes on, on, on the Guild Wars 2 subreddit. And that is a lot in comparison to most threads. I think it's the most in the last two weeks, at least probably the most in the last month. This is the biggest thread with the most interest in it, I think. And what, what this guy basically is talking about is, is, is he hates coming into a map, and I believe most of the time here he's talking about ore, and uh, the only thing that's posted in the chat is, where's the Zerg? And then somebody says, oh, it's over here, and so they go there. And that, that's the only comment. It's the only chat. There's no, there's, and I think this is somebody who wants to get into, he likes the immersion aspect and he wants to, you know, he wants to play with people and do the cooperative thing. But when he goes over to an event and he says, hey, can somebody help me with this? He gets crickets on the map chat because they're just following the same chain back and forth over and over again because that's the most efficient one. That's the most useful one. Uh, and I was going to pose the question to the panel and be like, so, have any of you experienced this? And then get a bunch of answers from different people on different servers, like Kai's server and our server and other people. But I got no panel. I got freelancers. You know, so I, I, got, know. <laughs> you know I got a very simple fix for this. Okay. Randomize the rewards. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, listen up. You randomize the rewards in ore. You make it where, let's say, an event gives you anywhere from 250 to 800. You also add diminishing returns. Okay. So... If I got roughly, you know, let's say the table was 250 to 500 and I got 400, next time I do the event, the table would be 150 to 350, for example, okay? Very simple. You do that. But also, make it where if you're level 80 and you go to any map in the game, we'll say like above level 20 or so, mm -hmm. you get the same types of rewards there. Yes, so, please. There <laughs> I want to be able to... No, but... There, no, you're exactly right, because there are places I haven't fully explored with my Elementalist. I'd right. like to get full so, map completion, but I just don't feel the drive to go back and do a non-challenging map that's so trivial where I just walk through and one-shot everything as I walk from point A to point B, connect the dots, get all the things, do all the hearts, and leave. I want a challenge. Is that so right. much to ask for? So this would encourage players to be able to explore the map because they can be sure if they go to, I mean, maybe not like a level 20 zone or something, but like a level 50 zone. There are a lot of awesome level 50 zones. Mm -hmm. They really are. Uh, 60 zones. I was, I mean, heck, I'm still like 78% map completion. I started working on it. And I went to Mount uh, Maelstrom, right? Yes. For the first time, I'm like, this is freaking awesome. I've never been here. Giant volcano you know? with a big fire but, um, elemental in the middle. That's great. That's cool. It thing. just occurred to me, though, that if they maybe if they made it where it's just a little more tougher. I know they already kind of scale it up where you're sort of even yeah. with the mobs, but not so much. I mean, we know you're still pretty much steamroll. If they increase the difficulty just a little bit more, or if and they let you then, choose it. Why can't I press a button that says hard mode? Like, why can't I set a difficulty? And it's like, okay, you want hard mode. You're in this level 60 zone. We're going to set you at 57. Have fun. But, okay. But the core thing is make the rewards the same yeah. or, or similar. But they vary. Again, they vary. 
Um, the varying element is the most important part. It's the same reason why the same boss doesn't always drop the same loot. They've, ch they've evolved that over the MMO history for one reason, and that's because you can't plan it out as effectively. Um, if they vary the rewards, they, I mean, they already vary the loot. Most MMOs do now. Um, the, now you can get precursors from anywhere. I'm told, you know, yeah. well, um, anywhere over I think level 55 or 60. I think right. that was the number, if I remember the patch notes. But correctly. make it where like the diminishing returns lasts like days. So it, you, as a player that's always doing PVE, it's not forcing you. I mean, you can stay in the same general areas. You can stay in ore. There's a lot of events besides the one chain, you know. Um, but make it where you know if you are wanting a, a change of pace or just a different flavor of the month. You can do so without really penalizing yourself. You can go to Frost Gorge. A lot of people go there. Rewards are similar to Ore there. Um, but maybe not just Frost Gorge. You can go to Mount Maestrum. You can go to all these other really cool places. ArenaNet can show off all of this other creative aspect. You know, They didn't just design Ore, people. You know? Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, and you can get similar rewards there. And... Uh, you know, you don't get penalized for going to these other areas and doing events there. And then you and your buddies, even the more casual players, can say, instead of what gets us the most for tonight since we're getting together and playing, what do we feel like doing? You know, do we want to kill centaurs tonight? Do we want to save, you know, save this this town? You know, you can get more selective and more immersed into the game. Yeah, and and not only that, you can feel like, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would like to go and visit these other areas and explore this amazing world because some of the co coolest things you can find are events that are off the beaten track and characters that you never knew about but you'll never go there because once you get to level 80 there's no re there's no rewards for you there so why do it i mean there's very slow rewards it's not worth it in comparison if you're trying to go for a legendary or if you're trying to go for uh even an, an, uh, one of these new ascended items if you go there it's going to take you 10 times as long so it's like i it's not worth the extra cool stuff but uh the other problem Problem, and I think that was identified in this thread that it, that is a very good point is that the reason everybody asks where's the Zerg is because you get way, way more stuff way mm -hmm. faster in a Zerg than you do by yourself or even with a group of two or three other people because the way the scaling works is, oh, there's more players, better throw more things that everyone can tag and get rewarded on. So if you're in a Zerg and you are you have you know you're good at tagging stuff as soon as those chains come up I did this once or twice when there was an event broken in ore where there was like 25 30 people and so many mobs would spawn I dropped <laughs> one thing right as they spawned and I would get so much loot and then they would spawn on the other side I ran over there so much loot it was like Every single time a wave would spawn I would get as much loot as if it was just me doing a normal event by myself Every wave would do that, and there was like 20 waves, so it, it, that's, that's a problem. The scaling system needs to be less about quantity and more about quality and, and enemies that maybe do massive AoE so it forces you to spread out or something. I don't know, but, but some, they got to implement a system I would that just like to see a mob that servers. drops tons of stacks of bleed and then casts Epidemic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe I'm evil, but I just find it hilarious. <laughs> I would be the guy on the mountain laughing, like you know, or something like that. But yeah, they need they need to spread out players a bit because right now you either are going to or you're running dungeons, or you're running fractals. Fractals drops a lot of loot too, Bridger. Yeah, um, fractals. You know, a whole lot. Um, but you're either one of those three places, and like I keep saying over and over, ArenaNet has one of the best artistic teams and the best writers, etc., that I've ever seen. But they've They've worked on the entire game, not just ore. So they just need to figure out a way to encourage players. Maybe like a, a scavenger hunt or something. You know, maybe like the next way to get, um, you know, legendaries or ascended gear could be like this fun little, you know, where you have to explore the world and get certain things. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, it, it's it's tough. It's it's very interesting. And so what else do I have here? Um, is is I think it's certainly different per server. The guy, the problem that the describe the guy is having, where nobody answers you or something like that. That certainly might be whatever server he's on. Uh, did he say which server he's on here? Um, um, no, I can't. I, 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 I don't remember off the top of my head. But somebody pointed out that that's not the same thing that happens on my server. You know, we we have helpful people that will go and help you, etc., etc. Uh, and 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 then you know somebody else points out, well. 
you know, there are there, the, the mobs drop loot that doesn't seem consistent with what they are. You can kill a champion with a whole bunch of other people, and it, and it gives you the same kind of loot table as the regular guy, who's a lot easier. Or the really hard guy, who's not a champion, drops the same loot as the really easy guy, who's not a champion. And it's all kinds of different examples of those kinds of things happening in Ore. So there's a, there's a lot of really good answers to this question. There's, there's a lot of good discussion going on in here and talking about it. So definitely check out the show notes if you're really interested in this specific topic. Uh, there's one really long discuss, uh, sort of thread started by Beetlejuice where he comes up with a lot of solutions that we sort of talked about here. I thought it was a really cool thing. Um, so yeah, I, was. I, I have some hope that there will be some more systems in the future that, pro- that provide some good incentive and, and sort of fix these kinds of issues. Because uh, these are kinds of things that you don't notice right away, that you only notice when you realize that, okay, the incentive program is creating this experience in PvE. You know? Right. And it's it's the long term things too. Like not even Arena Net could, you know, through private testing could determine that this kind of thing would happen. Um I don't think they honestly expect it or to be as popular as it is now. Um you know, the it's just something that they're gonna have to fix over time. No game's perfect when they launch, so Absolutely. And uh so I I have like I said, we, we we've seen lots of good stuff from them. So all right, let's see. Was there any other important things i've been trying to pull together yes right here so um we've got two different guild shout outs this week before we sign out for the night uh we've got <clears throat> the red slayers on northern shiver peaks excuse me quote we are a small casual guild looking for more members our two main goals of the guild are to build a small community for events dungeons and world versus world and we are just about just about having a good time check us out at red slayers dot e-n-g-i sorry e-n-j-i-n dot com red slayers dot engine dot com uh, contact us there or in game if interested contacting game is brungan moose jaw that's a great name <laughs> that is a cool name so am i that's a char if i ever heard one i i i joined that gale just because of that guy's name yeah there you go brungan <laughs> moose jaw b-r-u-g-u-n moose jaw so uh the, all this info is going to be in the show notes by the way and uh let me, let me pull up the website here if you guys want to see it. it's you know a typical engine site but but the engine sites are are certainly they get the job done and they don't require a whole lot of work which when you're running a guild you don't want to be a website administrator for a custom made website as well so it's it's quite useful for these kinds of things. What are you situations. trying to say Bridger? <laughs> I'm saying this this kind of event website works really well and you you don't have to have a teamlegacy.net if, in order to be awesome. This one I think you know they look snazzy, they don't cost that much and they save the guild I, a I lot just... of trouble. All they had to say to me, like, honestly, is that they're on Northern Shiver Peaks. I have a lot of respect for guilds on Northern Shiver Peaks. They've gone through a lot of stuff. Um, and if they do World v. World with all the other guilds on Northern Shiver Peaks, props to them, uh, honestly. Because it, uh, it takes a little bit of patience to World v. World on that server. All right. We've got a very interesting one here as well. A. Ordem. I, I don't know what that stands for, but it says we are a community of Portuguese players created on the 1st of January 2011 with the objective of uniting a group of players that the sh- shared the same ideals. We're not a hardcore community because all of us have families with whom we should want to spend our time with. Despite that, between our members, we can find all kinds of players. Our guild takes its highest regard, the values of friendship, a strong team spirit, participation, and organization in all that we do. We're focused on world versus world and find our desolation or if you want to move there because this sounds like good to you if you're you speak portuguese that's probably very useful a or a or dem a o r d e m is the name and a o r d e m dot net is the website a very snazzy looking site here uh might very well be another engine site it has that look but it certainly does the job and they've got some cool uh you know images here i think that's their guild having captured uh, stone mist so that's very cool definitely bodes well for them so definitely check that out look at that like a low rotating globe there somebody spent some good time in that somebody says it means the order oh well there you go a there you or go. Dem. So, so anybody that speaks Portuguese that might be interested in a guild, I'm sure we've got some out there. Uh, there you go, Desolation Server. So uh, I'll put all that in the show notes if you guys want to check it out, talesofteria.com. Yep, and remember, guys, you guys can uh, send your guilds. We, we like to kind of promote the community. So if you're starting up a guild, you got a, a unique premise, or if you got uh, – uh, I don't know, maybe you've been a guild that's been around for years. Um, by all means, send us some mail because Bridger sorts through them and he randomly selects some best he can and we'll shout you guys out. And, and when you send it in, uh, 
give me a website or a contact name or an email because sending a <laughs> shout out and say we're recruiting come check us out and then no information on how to contact that is a problem <laughs> i can't really give those ones a shout out so i try maybe to get it's a guild full of ninjas <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know where to find us then you are not worthy <laughs> if your google foo is not strong enough <laughs> i guess that's the plan so all right i guess we're with that we will end the official cast for tonight. Uh, we'll, we'll maybe do some, some after hours. Might jump into some world viewers. It's going to be a good time. Uh, we'll see you guys in two weeks. Next week's Planet Side 2. Uh, on, and on, that's going to be on the Bridger15 stream, twitch.tv slash Bridger15. I'm going to try to move all the stuff over there eventually. But for now, we're staying on uh, Tales of Tyria for this one. So, have a good night, everybody. I'm Bridger signing off. Woo. See you guys. Long one. Yeah, you know, people pointing out it's still free to transfer servers. They must have had something really wrong with their guesting feature. They were touting that for so long, and uh, then just all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it's not up. It never was. Yeah, that's... I don't know. There's, there's a thread right now about it. People saying it's about time. We need to close off transfers, but... I think what ArenaNet's also worried about is that some servers are severely underpopulated, you know, World v. World, because, well, let's be honest, a lot of people left World v. World, so. Yeah. And uh, what, what you've had happen now is a lot of people from the lower tier servers that still wanted to do World v. World, they moved to the higher tier servers, so um, that's kind of what's going on. So if ArenaNet closes down transfers right now, and you find yourself on... Um, one of the smaller, you know, the lower tier servers, you will never be able to do World v. World, ever. Yeah, I'm trying to get Matt Visual on for the uh, conversation about Winter's Day. Unfortunately, Great and Vega have moved on to bigger and better things or smaller and lesser games, if you want to look at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we wish them luck. And I, you know, I don't blame you know, them. They, they, I'm sure they got a lot of hours out of Guild Wars 2. Yeah, Aku's big into Planet Side too. Yeah, should, Aku's playing should... Planet Side too. No, he's he's been playing with us. Oh, okay. He yeah, was I'll there. see. He was Maybe you can get Friday. him on the show. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean specifically, Vega and Great have uh, moved away from Guild Wars Two specifically. So yeah. that that's that's why they haven't been on, and they're probably not going to be on. Well, I know uh, Great and Vega both future. still hang around the the Team Legacy oh, yeah, community, yeah. but they're yeah they're definitely done with Guild Wars Two. But yep. you never know with Vega and Great with PVE content may bring them back for a little bit. Kai was going to be on tonight, unfortunately, uh, and and she was supposed to be on tonight. But two hours ago, she she ma she emailed me and said, oh, "I have a midterm tomorrow in the morning." And of course, in the morning, since she stays up until like two a.m. to be on with us, uh, that that precluded. You know, it's worth fifty yeah. percent of her grade or something. Well, you got so you got a couple people asking here. So so just for cur people curious, if they can see this on the YouTube after, um, if we have people that are a asking to see if they can join the show, how would they go about doing that? Well, send an email to feedback at talesofteria dot com. Uh, I, I I already have some from people that wanted to be on specific shows like the Necromancer show or something like that. But if you know, we could definitely use uh, a couple of backup hosts or, or co-hosts. I'm going to try to get Matt on a lot more because Matt's a really good guy and uh, the, the shows that Matt Visual was on were really awesome. I really like him. So if he's interested yep. in coming on to be a more regular host, I'd like to see that. Kai isn't always a usually relied on great to fill in the holes whenever somebody couldn't show up but, uh, you know, he's, he's gone. So uh, I, if, if there's anybody out there still playing a lot of Guild Wars 2 and sort of wants to take that backup role, I could definitely use somebody who's willing to be on, you know, every Sunday and say, yes, I'll definitely be available. As well, it'll be every other person. Sunday. So. Every other Sunday. Sorry. Yes, indeed. So uh, so that's a, asking a little bit less of people. But Great was always fantastic for that. Anytime, you know, I needed somebody, he was like, yep, no problem. Or or sometimes, you know, he'd have his own online things. But, you know, I 90% of the time he'd be there for me. So I certainly appreciate it that uh so we'll see if uh, we get any more feedback like that the process is going to be pretty simple just you know send me an email 
tell me that you're interested and we'll get on Skype at some point and we'll talk about Guild Wars 2 and then I'll say, okay, that's great. I'll talk to you later and after I go through all the interviews this way, I'll pick the person or persons if there's two or three people that really fit the, the bill, but it's probably only going to be one or two people. I don't want to split it up too much and, and sort of just say, okay, these are the, these are the people that can best provide what we need on the show and what we need is somebody who can A, pick up a conversation even if it's falling apart like whenever I stop talking freelancer has something to say that is a rare gift <laughs> or, I don't or know curse if I should say thank or you or <laughs> curse I don't know which one I seem to have the same kind of thing everybody yells at me for talking too much but on a show like this it's it's sometimes useful um, and and a lot of times when I'm you know when I've been interviewing people in the past and it's not necessarily their fault I this this is a bad thing when I talk so much sometimes but um you know, uh, not everybody has the capability to just have something new to say at the end of every sentence that somebody says. So that is one of the things that we're looking for. And then simply, you know, being able to express yourself cogently and quickly and, of course, entertainment value. If you can, you know, joke around and throw some improv in there that makes ha people... having a having a cat in the background. work <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> That's all you need. Or if you've got a puppy. If you can put a puppy on the camera the whole time that can back you up and be like, rawr, rawr, he's right, rawr, then, then you're good. One <laughs> second of silence is broadcast failure. No, I understand. <laughs> That's actually kind of true. But to, Bridger, to, uh, a little to what you guys may or may not know, Bridger uh, studied into radio quite a bit. I am actually a communications major. I, yeah. stud I and, and they wouldn't let you just be a communications major at my college because they're like, no, 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 we couldn't do that to you. You have to have a minor. We can't let you out into the world as just a communications major. <laughs> so I had a minor in political science. Why? Because at that point where they told me, by the way, you have to have a minor, I was like, well, out of all these other things, I only need one class in political science because I had just taken a lot of electives because I like history and poli-sci was cool. Cause it was, so I was like, okay, international relations. Bam, there we go. That fulfills it. Now I've got a minor. <laughs> it was weird. All right, Bridger, I have to cut out and run some World v. World. All right, I'll hop on. All right, good All right. show. Have a good one, guys. Uh, and uh, you know what? I'll stream some. If anybody wants to watch it, I'm going over to the Bridger 15 stream if you want to watch some World v. World. Uh, so twitch.tv slash Bridger 15. You know what? Why the hell am I switching? I got people right here. I'm just going to stay on, and I'm going to launch the game and go into World vs. World. That's how I'm There you go. Right. That works. I might alter the... Uh, the 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 the, the bitrate a little bit higher for the purposes of the thing. So I might disconnect and have it reconnect. So just stay on, stay right here. We'll be right back in a moment. This is when you guys grab your pizza rolls. You yes. Know. <laughs> wow. Wow. That was really offensive. If you want to look at it in a particular way. <laughs> or, hey, what are you talking about? I realistic. eat pizza rolls. I eat pizza rolls too. I know. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll be right back.